Now we are in the middle of uh, the sermon series of meeting Jesus. Because it is important for us to meet with Jesus. Now you may say, well, but I can't see Jesus. But Jesus says that blessed are those who do not see me and yet believe. The word of God speaks about Jesus. We can find him. We can meet with him as we open the word of God. And this is what the law says that you know, the, the word of God is active and living. And we can meet with Jesus through his word. So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us as we continue this series. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the living Christ. You died, buried for three days and rose again. Lord, thank you that you are seated on the right hand of the Father. Thank you that by your Spirit, Lord, you continue, Lord, to move, Lord, in our humanity, continue to move in the, in the history, Lord, of humanity in today and also, Lord, in the years to come, until you come again, through to eternity. So we thank you. We open our hearts to you and say, Lord, be with us, meet with us, even as we desire to meet with you today. In Jesus' name, Amen. So every Sunday until about end of August, except for some special days, we will have different encounters of Jesus with individuals uh, or with groups of people. And we want to learn about Jesus. We want to learn also the response of the people. We, perhaps we can identify with some of these people. Through these encounters, we will receive grace and truth. They exude out of the person of Jesus Christ. Nobody can remain unchanged when you encounter Jesus Christ. Either your heart gets softer and warm towards Him and the things of God, or our hearts get harder as, as we push Him away from us. So meeting Jesus can be quite dangerous. James Francis wrote in a book called One Solitary Life. And there he wrote, he said all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as much as Jesus. You have to realize that when Jesus started his ministry, you know, he gathered together a band of disciples that are the most likely to fail. And yet out of this band of disciples, the church grew. And over the course of the history of the church, there were times when the church has departed, you know, from the doctrines, from, from the, the, the tenets of the faith, about to die. And yet, because Jesus is alive, he, he kept the church going. He sent revivals, he poured his Holy Spirit, he rekindled the love, the truth, again, over and over again. Jesus told in the, in, in the Bible that, you know, his kingdom is like a mustard seed. It, it started very small, but yet it grew and grew and grew. So we have this confidence of Jesus, who is our Lord. You know, two weeks ago I preached about the encounter of Jesus with Nicodemus. An aged, learned, religious leader. Today, I want to focus on a completely different sort of person. A young person. Not very learned. Peter, the fisherman. Had Jesus not met him, he probably would be just one of the few thousands of fishermen that lived and eked out a living along the shores of Galilee. Lived an ordinary life. We know that he, he was married, you know, fed his family, and then just died. And the sense of time would have wiped out the memory of such a person called Simon Peter. But Jesus deals with all types of people, from all walks of life, the learner, the not learner, the young and the old. And Jesus knows how to deal with each one of us. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus says, I know the heart of man. He is no ordinary person. That's why meeting Jesus is so important. That even when we read the word of God, 
in our time alone with God, the one most important thing that we should always ask for is to say, can I see Jesus there? I want to meet with Jesus. Coming back to this young fisherman, Simon Peter, we often thought that, you know, in one gospel account, that Jesus recruited him to be one of his followers, just like that, that Jesus was walking by along the lake of Galilee, he saw a couple of fishermen drawing their nets, Andrew, Simon's brother, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, and so Jesus said, you there, come and follow me. As if they just dropped people ties, dropped their nets, left their fathers and just followed Jesus. But that is not really the case, because if you read the accounts in the four Gospels, you'll find that, uh, that Simon Peter actually met with Jesus a few times prior to that. So we're going to read two of these accounts from the Gospel of um, Luke and Matthew. So let's read together from Luke chapter 5. One day, let's read together, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and have, haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch the men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So the next one is from Matthew chapter 4. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And the ones they left the nets and followed him. Well, these were just two of the gospel accounts. In the Gospel of John, because it's just too long to read, I just have to summarize that the first time when uh, Simon Peter encountered Jesus was when his brother Andrew was a follower of uh, John the Baptist uh, and another disciple of uh, John the Baptist go with the guru, the Sifu, John the Baptist and Jesus walked by and John the Baptist said Behold the Lamb of God and these two of them, Andrew and this other disciple left John the Baptist and tried to stalk Jesus following behind and Jesus turned around and said How can I help you? and they said Oh, we just want to know where you live you see, in those days, the rabbi did not choose people to say, okay, you, you can become my follower, you can become my follower. In those days, the people choose the teacher. Like, oh, can you be my teacher? You know, this is how the disciples would choose a rabbi. So I presume these two folks, Andrew and the other unknown disciple, try to follow Jesus and find out where he stayed and perhaps ask him more questions. And so Jesus turned around and said, come come to my place, and they have this chat way through to the evening, so long until they have to put up the night, continue talking with Jesus, and what happened was that 
and you. Let's excite me, go and look for his brother. And say, bro, 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 you know, I have found the Messiah. I have found the Christ. And so he brought Simon Peter to see Jesus. And when Jesus saw Simon, he says, You are Simon, son of John, but you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, if you are Simon, if you are Simon before it's called Peter, you'll be a bit like, it's quite weird, right? This guy just called me. He, 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 he knows me. I'm Simon, son of John. But then how could he even change my name to Cephas, which means rock? Now, you don't simply change your name, right? Uh, your parents gave you the name. Very seldom do we change our own name. Uh, only those who own us, like the kings, will change the names of the, of the Israelite exiles in Babylon. They change the name of Daniel, right? Change it to some Babylonian name. Only those who own you, those who rule over you, like your parents, like the kings, or the masters that own the slaves, can change your name. So what would have gone through Peter's mind? You don't really know. He, he probably would say, who is this Jesus that says my name should be changed from Simon, which means read, you know, sort of bands according to the winds of the world, to become Cephas, Peter, which means a rock. This was his first encounter. You see, Jesus sees the potential. He does not just look at Peter and say, well, you are Greek. I don't really want you to be a follower. He says, I can change you. I can make you become a rock. This can be your destiny. If you were to come and follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. You see, as I said, Peter could have just lived an ordinary life and died in common term. But of course, we now know that Peter is a very famous name. You have streets that are named after him. You have a lot of churches that are named after him. You have a lot of babies throughout the centuries that were named after Peter. And one day in New Jerusalem, in the book of Revelation, one of the foundations in the, under the wall of this new city, the New Jerusalem, is also the name of Peter, together with the other apostles. Jesus said, I will make you, I will make you fishers of men. And we know on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the first sermon, and 3,000 souls were added into the kingdom. Such is the power when you let yourselves to be made available to Jesus to say, I can make you into something completely different from where you are now. I can change you from a reed to become a rock. We have to know who this Jesus is. We do not need to remain what our parents have told us. You know, they say, well, you are destined to be this, you are destined to be that. Jesus can change your destiny. Because Jesus is no ordinary man. So we have to understand that the calling of Jesus, uh, of Peter, is very important. Because Jesus says, come follow me, that I will make you. Because if you do not come and follow him, that is a precondition. I don't think Peter will be able to be made to become what he was. And we have to ask ourselves, what is our calling? Because all of us are called by God. Paul reminded the Thessalonians, Thessalonians to say, consider your calling. And then he reminded the Ephesians to say, walk worthy of the calling of God in your life. And Peter said, confirm your calling and election. So we have to make sure that, you know, we are, have come and followed Jesus. How do you know that we are following Jesus? How do you know that I've come and I've followed Jesus? Because unless you're following Jesus, Jesus will find it maybe difficult to make you to be fishers of men or be somebody else or some other ministry. So how was Peter called? How was Peter called? Well, the second, the second, second encounter of Jesus if we were to assume that John the Apostle wrote uh, the stories, incidents chronologically, although that may not always be the case, because in ancient days, the, uh, the writers do not necessarily put everything in chronology, because they can put them in themes. 
But I believe that the, in the Gospel of John, definitely the wedding at, at the Cana was in line with the chronology. And that comes before Luke 5. And the Bible tells us that some disciples went with uh, Jesus at this wedding and, and Jesus turned the water into wine. And it's very possible that Simon Peter was with Jesus. So in the mind of Simon Peter, okay, Jesus is a miracle worker. And then in Luke 4, we find that Jesus, one Sabbath afternoon, went to heal Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And a fever left. So what went through Simon Peter's mind? Well, this is not just somebody that turned water into wine. He's also a healer. I, I see in my own eyes. And then the last encounter, before he dropped his nets and followed Jesus, was the passage that we read in Luke chapter 5. Jesus was preaching. We read that. And the crowd started to gather. And, and Jesus of all places was to choose this speech that he preached. And as the crowd gathered, you can see that people are starting to push a little bit forward, right? And so Jesus has to move back very right near to the water's edge. And what did, uh, what did Jesus do? He, he went and, and called, Hey Simon, you might come on, onto this boat which belongs to you and just help me to push that boat a little bit further into the water so that I can address the crowd. And that's not necessarily a bad pulpit to use. It's a bit like, you know, instead of you coming and now on the, on, the, on the boat, I move back, you can't come too near to me, and there's a crowd gathered. I'm using that like, a, like a, a pulpit. But what was Peter doing then? Peter together with, uh, with Andrew and, and John and uh, James, they were fishermen, they were they were cleaning their nets because for the whole past evening and night they were fishing and they caught nothing and they need to dry the nets so they were cleaning their nets and Jesus was preaching and suddenly Jesus having preached to the people say well ok Peter now can you take this boat deeper you're going to cast your net now what would Peter think Crazy, you know, you just spent the whole night trying to catch a fish and um, you couldn't catch any. And we just wash our nets and you want us to go in the middle of the day to cast the net? Don't you know that we are expert fishermen? You are just a carpenter turned rabbi. What do you know about fishing? You must feel a little bit irritated. In fact, you can detect it in the words. You say, Master, which means that. Uh, Simon Peter recognized the authority of Jesus. That's why he said, Master. He said, We have toy, we worked our hearts out. The whole night we got nothing. Basically, say, Look, come on. It's not like you get fish. Fishes don't come to the surface during a big day. But because you're a master at your word, I'll just do it. Alright, just do it. So he went and uh, threw the nets in. And suddenly he, he got hold of this huge hole of fishes was so heavy that Simon and presumably his brother Andrew was helping, could not bring the fishes up. So he has to call the other fishermen. He said, Oi, oi, come, come. This is really too much. And so they came along, so two boats were trying to haul this net out and, and they filled the two boats with so many fishes that the two boats started to sink. What went through Peter's mind? He would probably have thought, wow, this is incredible. I've never seen such number of amount of fishes caught ever in my life or in my father's lifetime. I've never heard my, you know, my grandfather saying that they have caught so many fishes. This is great. A few more of this catch, we can retire and build a mansion. Uh, you know, we can just relax. But that was not what went through Peter's mind. What the Bible tells us is, is very interesting. He said what? He said, depart from me. Go away from me. I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. Something has struck Peter. There was this spiritual revelation. Why would he even scream out and say, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. What has that got to do with catching so many fishes? Because 
trust in Peter's mind. He knows that this is no ordinary man. You don't command the fishers to come at midday and fill up all the nets. He probably have thought maybe it's Jesus who, who, who somehow stopped them from having any fish for the last evening until the night time. No fish whatsoever. There is something about Jesus. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Oh Lord. No longer did Simon Peter address Jesus as master, or rabbi, but as Lord. Which means the owner. Suddenly there is a revelation. We do not know exactly what sins uh, Simon Peter committed. Well, thank God, you know, God does not publish his sin necessarily, or our sins in public. It would be horrible to think about your sins uh, being, you know, screamed up here and everyone watch and know. It could be that Peter may have been a very dishonest fisherman. He might have sold to some innocent widows stale fish and say, no, these are fresh fish. He might even have cheated in Balances and ways. We don't know. It's just a conjecture. Could it be that Simon Peter, while he was washing the nets, was listening to what Jesus was preaching to the people about his kingdom, about the need for the forgiveness of sins? And in his heart, he may say, Come on, how could you forgive sin? You are just a mere man. You don't know the sort of sins I've committed. If only you know. Perhaps. But whatever it was, there is a sense of unworthiness that well up from Peter's heart to say, Lord, go away, I'm not worthy. Go away, go away, I'm a sinful man. That's quite a, quite, quite a normal human reaction, is it not? Like if you have watched some bad movies, you know, that you should not be watching uh, on a Saturday night and Sunday morning is a church prayer meeting, you will want to come to the prayer meeting. There's a certain amount of guilt, or you quarreled with uh, your spouse or your friends the night before. You will not be that keen to come to a prayer meeting to meet with God. Or you know you have done something wrong. There is a distance between you and God. So you stop even coming to church because you felt so bad. Go away. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. But what was the response of Jesus? What was the response of Jesus? Jesus says, come. Come and follow me. You see, Peter's previous response was that he humbled himself and knelt before Jesus and said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. You see, he realized that Jesus is no ordinary man. He is indeed the one who can save him from his sins. No longer was Peter worried about his finances. That was the least thing in his mind. He said, well, I can preach, you know, partnering with this Jesus. He can preach while I can catch fish, and together we can have a great life together. No, he suddenly realized that Jesus is no ordinary man. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. That's what his brother Andrew told him. This is a completely different ball game now. It's about him realizing that this is a man that does not come from the earth, but is from heaven. He is no ordinary person. And that's why Peter suddenly became one that just humbled himself and cried out to say, you know, woe to me. A bit like what Isaiah experienced when he saw God in Isaiah uh, chapter 6. He said, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a dead man. Because I have seen the Lord. We also read in Revelation, whenever people meet with God, they just tumble down and fell down like dead. In the same way, when Simon realized that this is no ordinary man, he knelt down. Because he realized that now he is the Lord. He is a creator. He's not just a rabbi. He's not just a miracle worker. He's not just an exorcist that casts out some unclean spirits in the synagogue. He's not just a healer. He's more than all this combined together. He must be divine to be able to command the fishes to come. 
And it is divine. And he was preaching about kingdom, his kingdom and sin. Then truly he is a Messiah. He, Peter realized that he needs to be saved. He needs saving. And that's why he was prepared to say, Lord, you know, I'm not worthy of you coming so near to me, revealing yourself. But Jesus says, come. Because Jesus is extending His grace and mercy, even though we are not worthy. This is really the punchline. That we have nothing to offer. Not even Peter's expertise in fishing can help in anything in the call of God. The call of God on your life and my life is purely by grace. And he's not calling you as a rabbi. He's not calling you to say, come and learn from me. I'm a good teacher. I will teach you how to live your life well on this earth. He's more than that. He's not a healer to say, okay, come, come to church. You are sick, you know, in the name of Jesus, you'll be healed. He's more than that. He's not about coming to fulfill your needs. We were debating whether we should call this, is it worth it to follow Jesus? Actually, there's nothing about whether it's worth it or not worth it. He is your greater, my greater. He is your king, my king. He is our owner. That's it. He is our owner. He owns us. He created us. He made us. That's why he will change Simon to say, Lord, you'll be Peter. And that's why Simon has no hesitation to leave everything about his security. Right? His next. He just dropped his next immediately and followed Jesus. He left his family ties, his father's. Not that he did not honor his father, but he said, Here is my greater calling me. So he dropped everything and followed Jesus. There is that revelation. As the hymn says, grace amazing, grace divine. Demands my life, my soul, my life. You are not worthy to be called by Jesus to follow him. Or even to be near him. But Jesus offered that. So that we do not, we, are not, we don't belong to ourselves, but we belong to Jesus. And when Jesus said, Follow me, that is a very powerful statement. You know that? The Apostle Paul says, Follow me as I follow Christ. You see, many great, I mean, many religions main religions in the world. They say, follow me, I discovered this sacred book. I discovered this teaching. I discovered this truth, follow me. I am enlightened, follow me. But Jesus said, he didn't say, follow me, I discovered the truth. Jesus said, follow me, I am. Jesus did not say, follow me, I found the way to the Father. He didn't say that. Other religions will say, yes, I found the way, this is the way. Jesus says, follow me, I am the way. Jesus did not say, follow me, and I show you eternal life. He said, Jesus says, follow me, I am the life. In fact, Jesus says, believe in God, believe also. He is not from this earth. He is not from this world. He was sent from above. In fact, he was using the word I am, which means the name of God, Yahweh. I am who I am. That's why the Jewish leaders could not stand him and wanted to stone him for blasphemy. Because he is from above. We cannot help but also to compare with another incident where Jesus also extend his welcome to another person, the rich young ruler recorded in two I think two places. One is in Mark chapter 10. We have to ask ourselves, what is the difference? Because Jesus did love this young ruler. And Jesus is saying, follow me. Because one day, this young ruler came to Jesus and knelt before him and said, good teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, okay, you got the Torah, the commandments, keep them. Because Jesus knows where he's coming from. He said, oh, I have been keeping all those commandments since young. What else do I need to do to 
gain eternal life. You see, he started with that question to Jesus. What must I need to do to gain eternal life? You see, he comes with his self-righteousness, whatever that he had brought to say, look, you know, I'm, I'm now ready to, to meet with God. I've done all these things. Jesus looked at him and said, well, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have. Sell your shares. Sell your houses. Sell your cattle. Release all your slaves, all your servants. And whatever money you have, give it to the poor. I don't need your money. Give it to the poor. Send it in advance to heaven. And then you follow me. So what happened to this rich young ruler? He may, be, he may have inherited the money. I don't know. He might have been a very successful businessman. Wherever that he got his money from. But he looked down and felt very sad because he was not prepared to do that. You see, he has broken the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He was not prepared to do that. So he walked away sad. Now Jesus did not lower down his standard and said, never mind, come back, come back, come back. Over time, you will give your money. He did not. And let the young man go. Even though Jesus actually extended his invitation to him and said, come and follow me. You see, you cannot bring anything with you to follow Jesus. You see, the, the rich young ruler considered Jesus as a good teacher. He cannot find any fault about Jesus' life. And Jesus said, who's good except God? Right? He's actually making an assessment of Jesus as good, but he's only a teacher. Because he operates from his perspective that he's only a man, a teacher. So he's also striving to, you know, to enter into the kingdom with his good works, not knowing that he broke even the first commandment. He can't even give up his wealth to follow God. And yet you call Jesus good teacher, right? It means I'm going to be listening, I'm listening, I'm obeying. What else do I need to do? Jesus said, well, sell, you know, sell everything you have and follow me. He could not do that. You see, because if you operate in your own flesh and strength, you say, I can do it, I can do it, I can look to Jesus. You can't be fail. So if we were to follow Jesus with our own ideas of what we have inherited, our natural talents, or what you have gained in your life, and think that you can use that to follow Jesus, you will fail. Because the only way to follow Jesus is what Peter did. I have nothing. I have nothing to offer to you, Jesus. And yet Jesus said, Dude, come. Come and follow me. But this rich young will say, I've done all this. I've done all this. What more do I need to do? You see, he operates from his natural man's perspective. He thought that you can bring, you know, his, what he has done. Some of us we are very gifted. Or oh, have our talents, we can be a great leader, we can be a great singer, a great uh, speaker, a great musician, a great thinker, a great intellect, a great businessman. And say, well, I can follow Jesus in this line. The answer is no. You may have wealth, you may have inherited, you may be able to do a lot of things. You may even have good looks. You can have a high IQ, whatever, but you cannot use that as a means to follow Jesus. You start with nothing. It's only when we give all of our service to God, including our talents, including our money, whatever, to Jesus. And when Jesus sends us back, to become fishers of men. Then yes, we can use those gifts to serve others. We can use our high IQ. We can use the ability to make money. We can use, um, you know, our, our talents, our, our music abilities, our singing ability to serve Jesus, to serve others for the glory of God. But not in terms of following Jesus. We start from zero. It's only when we follow Jesus just like Jesus says that if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know that in Roman times, when you take up the cross to be crucified, you are naked, 
you actually carry nothing. So to follow Jesus means you don't, you don't carry your purse, you don't carry your talent. That's the last thing you think about. You just follow Jesus, just as you are. You don't lay any of our conditions before God to follow Him. We don't lay our abilities, everything, as, as, a, as part on the table, as part of following Jesus. Nothing. And so we ask ourselves that, as a result, maybe, you know, our following of Jesus, maybe not as, like what Simon Peter himself followed. Don't forget, Simon Peter also had fear. That's why Jesus says, do not be afraid, right? Why do the church not follow Jesus? What are some of the reasons? No, the Christians are not following Jesus properly. Can it be? That's why the church is so weak. That's why we're not able to grow the church. We're not fishers of man. Because Jesus said, I will make you the fishers of man. Right? You can't make yourself the fish of man. Only Jesus can make you the fish of man. But that assumes that we are following him. Come follow me. Follow me as a person. That's what Jesus says. They're not following a program. Not even following the church. Not even seven discipline. He's following Jesus. That's Jesus instituted the church. Jesus instituted uh, you know, how the church uh, leadership and so on. Yes, Jesus has used those things. It's part of his order. But ultimately, we are to follow Jesus. What is before you when you come on Sunday? What is before you when you read God's word? Is it Jesus? Because David say, I always put the Lord in front of me. I always set the Lord before me. Perhaps we're not following Jesus properly. That's why it's so, it's so difficult for Jesus to make us, you and me, to be fishers of man. Perhaps we're like Peter. We have a lot of fears. Lord, I am a sinful man. I cannot serve you. I'm not so gifted. I've committed too many wrong things. I keep going to my sin over and over again. Do you know that Peter also did not always succeed? Do you know that? At first he said, depart from me, Jesus, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Do you know three years later, after walking with Jesus, when Jesus was taken out, was arrested, what did Peter do? He denied Jesus three times. He also failed. But there was a difference. There was a difference because we read at the end of John, the Gospel of John, that John, uh, Peter went back together with the disciples to go fishing again. And that particular night, they also caught nothing. So in the morning, he was you know, coming back to shore. And suddenly they saw this stranger in the shore. And this stranger said, put your net to the right side of your boat. And they did. And oh, there was this great college of fish. Isn't that something like, hey, this has happened before. It's a bit of a danger of you, huh? And uh, one of the disciples to Peter, he says, it is the Lord. And what happened to Peter? I mean, they were, they were naked fishing, right? And he, he put on a, a garment and rushed off to meet this stranger, to meet Jesus. You see, Peter did not say, go away, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. He went to see Jesus. Why? Because he understood the love and the grace of Jesus. This is a difference. And of course, Jesus restored him. Like, you know, you love me, feed my sheep, and ask him three times. There is something when we meet with Jesus. And so when you are like Peter, you say, God, I'm not worthy. You know, you know I, I, I'm so sinful. It's not an issue to God if you were to follow Follow him, which means he sets the example, he sets the direction of your life, right? He sets the pace of your life, that's what it means to follow him. And that's all he needs from you. Follow, come, follow me, and I will make you a fish of man. Sometimes it is our fear that stops us from following Jesus. 
And Jesus wants us to take away all those, those fears. It can be your insecurity. I'm sure Peter has to think about, you know, this is my father's business about fishing. You know, I can't just walk away. But if you know that Jesus is the man who is not from here, from the earth but from above, he will give you that faith and say, no problem, look, Jesus actually got the fish just like that. Financial security is not an issue. I need to follow him. It may be your relationships. I mean, Peter has to grapple with his, his father, look after his father, his wife, and so on. But he was prepared to leave all to follow Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. In the Ten Commandments, we have to honor our parents, we have to love our wives. But supremely, where is our heart? Ask me completely to follow Jesus. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. Then I will make you to be the person that I have intended you to be. Can it be that we may be like the rich young ruler? There are certain things that we are not prepared to give up to follow Jesus. Can it be that we come with an agenda before God? To say, Lord, you know, I give you some, no problem, but I keep some, okay? Or that God wants you please that I can come with my gifts. I'm following you, but deep inside us, we say, yeah, but I'm, I'm a great this, I'm a great that. So, we can, we can, we can actually sort of like ask ourselves and say, Lord, are we prepared to give everything? Everything. I come just as I am. Even all my gifts, my talents, come from you in the first place. I do not, I do not come with any presupposition on my, on my life. No, because self-righteousness and pride, I mean self-righteousness and pride are twin sisters, right, our brothers? And so self-righteousness and pride don't mix too well with Jesus. We have to ask ourselves, how do we follow Jesus? That even if we are very gifted, but Jesus sent us back, of course we can use all those gifts and talents. And yes, Jesus will multiply that to glorify Him. What do we close our eyes? We we'll ask the Lord and say, Lord, am I really following you? stopping God from making us to be who He wants us to be.